Welcome to this next video in the playlist Downstream Processing in the Pharmaceutical Industry. Today I'm going to talk about a topic that's very important to me as a polymer chemist because we are involved in the production of plastics. So here I would like to go into a bit more detail in the downstream processing of bioplastics with the hope of people giving more understanding how it works and seeing that more bioplastics are produced in the future. Well, what is a bio? Plastic. So according to the IUPAC definition, and I'm a member of the IUPAC polymer division, so this is very important. Uh, this is a bio-based polymer that's derived from biomass or issues of monomers derived from biomass. So the word plastic implies that it flows, so it also means that you have to be able to process these materials. And just as a short reminder, Polymers come from polymeros, which is many parts, so it's made from many repeating monomers. And in the case of the bioplastics, we can look at natural polymers, so things like cellulose and chitosan, and I will focus on one particular one, which I will show later on, or it can be chemically synthesized from sugar derivatives or lipids. Um, so what I've shown here as an image is P3HB, and in particular, I'm going to focus on one type of polymer, which I will describe in the next couple of slides. But what I will say that the downstream processing uh, process that I'm going to describe will be very much applicable across the board of bioplastics. So similar concepts will apply. Now, in particular, I want to focus on polyhydroxyalkanoates in this, this video. Um, so PHA, just to make it a bit shorter and easier to pronounce. And these are biodegradable polyesters that can be produced in a variety of microorganisms. And as you can see in this image here, they have many different applications. So it's not just bioplastics, you can also look at biofuels, biodegradable materials. And um, what's so special about this uh, class of polymers is that you have a wide range of monomers that you can use to really fine tune the properties. So what's so specific about this one that it can be used very broadly for many different applications. Uh, and the market size is increasing, so it's 81 uh, million US dollars. I think this was from last year, and this was predicted to double in the next couple of years. And this is due because an expected increase in environmental uh, regulation. And so far, the main market on bioplastics has been in Europe, uh, but it is limited in, in terms of uptake due to the high processing costs. And this is where these downstream processing elements becomes very important. Let's just have a look at the general uh, DSP. So as I mentioned before, this can mount up to a sustainable amount of cost. And in general, if you look at reviews, they say it can go up to 50% of the cost in terms of PHA. So what do you do? So PHA is in soil burn water and it accumulates in the cells. And it can assume, accumulate up to 90% of the weight of the cells. So you can imagine you have a very large quantity that you need to deal with. So you have these cells uh, and basically you need to get it out of the cells first. And um, so you could have like a, a pretreatment uh, step where you make sure that first of all, like you increase the porosity of the cells. Generally, you need some type of extraction process because you will need to get it out of the cells. Uh, and then there will need to be purification steps in order to get to the high purity that you need. Uh, and considerations that you make need to make here along the way is the final molecular weight, so MW, uh, because uh, it could be that you damage the polymer in the process. And for the final application, uh, the molecular weight for, for instance, the mechanical properties, uh, but also for other properties is very important. Now, I will go into the details of the sustainability, and here I will mainly focus on the extraction process, and I will give some suggestions on the costs. Now, you've seen in, in the previous slide, you've seen uh, the general diagram. Uh, so, and I mentioned the key is to first get the PHA out of the cells. So, but imagine first you probably need to remove the biomass. So you could have techniques like centrifugation, filtration and separation in order to actually get the cells. So that's a step before that. Then you have that pretreatment uh, of the cells in order to make the next step, which is the extraction step, uh, much simpler. And this particularly, so I would say the bottleneck at the moment is this extraction process due to the high costs but also what's very often overlooked is the impact on sustainability. Because we are dealing with a bioplastic here and quite often halogenated solvents are used for this step. So that doesn't match up with the sustainability uh, idea of having a bioplastic. 
And originally people used something which is called soxla extraction. So in soxla extraction, you extract things from a powder using different solvents. And there's a very specific setup for this. And they use chloroform, which is obviously a halogenated solvent for that. And this is still commonly used as a reference technique in order to compare it. So you do need a very large quantity of chloroform to do it. It can damage the polymer, plus it has a sustainability impact. Uh, but what was very useful about it is it reduces the final and the toxin content. And that has to do with the safety of the product. And I'll come back to that later. So it does work. But in order to go to a more sustainable process, and I'll show you an overview of what else you could try, people really want to move to non-halogenated solvents. So dimethyl carbonated has been speculated. There are a couple of other bio-based options, and here I've given uh, some of them that might be used, and some also, like for instance, ethanol can be derived from bio-based sources. So first of all, the thing you need to consider is the amount of solvent, also the energy input that's associated with the extraction process, and how sustainable the, the solvent itself is. Now, here is a brief overview of the extraction methods, and I haven't included mechanical methods in here. So mechanical methods are also very routinely used on large scale, uh, so bear in mind that this is also a very good option. So here it talks about the solvents, it talks about uh, green solvents that I mentioned before, but also things like uh, chemical digestion, supercritical fluids, uh, which is increasing but not widely available at the moment, or some biological recovery, such as, for instance, the use of enzymes, uh, which can be a very slow process, uh, and, but you don't need additional chemicals, and this would match up better with, I guess, the green aspect of the bioplastics. So you would need to consider all of those and consider the costs of whether that would actually mean that you can make a profit out of your bioplastics. Now we've seen some of the issues associated with the extraction and here actually in this image you can very clearly see this PHA accumulating in the cells. So that really gives you a very clear idea on how much you actually have in there. Now it's not just the extraction that's complicated, uh, but for the final application you need to think about the safety and the regulatory requirements. And I have mentioned the, the word endotoxins before. So there are things in the membranes, some uh, lipid polysaccharides, that can act as endotoxins. And the problem with endotoxins is that they are heat stable. So the general processes, like for instance, where you would autoclave things, are not that suitable to remove those. And this can invoke immune responses in people. So for biosafety regulation, it's very important that you show, but also that you demonstrate using some sensing techniques that you have removed these endotoxins for it before it can be used. And obviously the amount that's tolerated will depend on the application because whether you would use this for construction or for packaging where it's actually in contact with things that we eat, you can imagine that the regulation there is quite different. Now the way that people combat this, you've seen the general process, uh, is that it doesn't just stop after the extraction, even though I mentioned that's the most complicated step. So often you would need repeated dissolution and precipitation of the polymer, and then you would still need some chemicals, so something like ozone and peroxides, in order to make sure that you remove all of the endotoxins. So if you talk about sustainability, again, here you use chemicals, so that might also have an interference with the sustainability aspect. And in order to work out, besides the cost, what's the most uh, suitable downstream processing, if you're interested in sustainability, would be to do life cycle analysis. Because life cycle analysis would allow you to quantify and would tell you what the environmental impact is of each of the steps that you propose. I have done a previous video on the circular economy, which is also an important aspect in this case, particularly if we look at recycling and we look at bioplastics. So you can have a look at the video if you want to know a little bit more about how that works in practice. Now, finally, just to briefly summarize for you. So I've done a previous video where I looked at monoclonal antibodies and you will see here the focus is less on the sustainability, but much on different aspects. So hopefully you will have seen that different processes apply and there are different bottlenecks to tackle. Bioplastics are a growing market, so it also means that we need to look at particularly continuous downstream processing and making sure that in order to increase the uptake that we reduce the cost of the downstream processing. In order to, and you've seen that this is not a simple process and you will have to go for multiple steps, ranging from first collecting the biomass, 
getting it, extracting it, maybe doing some pre-treatment, getting it out of the cell, and then the final purification. And then in order to pick all these different units, we would consider things like sustainability, but also the quality requirements for the polymers, which can involve the molecular weight, the purity, but also the endotoxin allowance. And that depends on the application that you have in mind. Now, very much the type of microorganism and culture conditions are particularly important for mainly, I would say, for the extraction step. If you work with mixed cultures, you would get that you would find it's much harder to extract it from the cell. So you might need to employ different processes or consider different pretreatment methods. Now, what people have also shown, because as I mentioned, the sustainability aspect becomes really important. There's things like uh, that use bio-based solvents, or in this case, an aqueous two-phase extraction, that are uh, arising as more and more promising options. So hopefully you've learned a little bit about how this works in general. And next time, let's say if you work in industry, you would consider all these options and make a very informed choice on how you would proceed in order to get the most out of your product in terms of cost and of sustainability. Thanks for watching and do have a look at other videos in this playlist that go into more detail on downstream processing for some other applications.